were saying things like, I am in a fight for my life, I'm under stress, I'm in a battle. Um, so those, those thoughts and those conversations made me think, well, we can, we can deal with this like we do with combat trauma through peer support. And I was kind of on the fence because I thought, well, whistleblowers, it's kind of a hard subject to get your arms around. And then somebody connected with me on LinkedIn. She was former Navy. She was law enforcement. She was struggling with her agency after having made a disclosure of discrimination. And after we talked for about an hour, we were getting off the phone, and she said, I'm so glad I found somebody because I've been sitting here with my gun on my table. And that's when I thought, this is suicide prevention. We need, we need to really understand the skills and the coping on workplace traumatic stress, which is what I call it. So let's see if this works. Ah, yay. <laughs> so I always, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. So when we talk about the, the witches, the wizards, the flying monkeys in the workplace, I always use kind of Oz as this mythical workplace. So, for a moment, you all work in Oz, <laughs> so there's no, no worries about disclosures here. Um, and that's an org chart, right? That should look familiar to anybody who's ever been asked for their org chart. We'll talk more about org charts later. But there are perpetrators. There are these co-conspirators. The flying monkeys is a, is a term we use for them. I seriously use a term for them when we talk about mobbing and gaslighting. And then there's always these cautionists and bystanders. They know something's going on. Maybe there'll be a little bit of like, oh, be careful, don't say anything, don't do anything, don't get yourself in trouble. And then there are the bystanders who, when they see it, they don't want to get involved, they don't want to say it. Um, it will tell them something about their culture in the organization, and they become ghosts. They disappear, they leave, and most of the time we don't know why. We'll get back to them later as well. <laughs> So what is workplace bullying? Let's take a second here and define some of our terminology because I think this is important to understand that although, and I'm not gonna read the slides, I'm not really good at that. <laughs> These are here for those of you who need the, the visual and, and the cues. Um, I'm not the best at following my own slides. <laughs> but the, <laughs> the idea is that workplace bullying is, is part of this feeling that um, you're being intimidated, you're being gaslit, all of these things, but it's not illegal. Not yet, we're working on that. But some of these things, unless it's a violation of your um, civil rights as an employee, so discrimination because of your age, your gender, your race, your religion, your, um, uh, family status, whether you've been pregnant, not pregnant, um, all, there's like 14 different categories of things that is an illegal reason to discriminate against you. Or harass you. Those things are illegal. But some of this other stuff falls into these microaggressions, harder to get your hands around when we're trying to understand them, but um, just as difficult. And they can cause depression, anxiety, PTSD, suicidal ideation when, when these things go on because it's about this prolonged exposure, right? We talk about combat trauma as prolonged exposure. A hostile environment is a prolonged exposure because you're living every day uh, feeling under attack, pressured, bullied, intimidated, and you're trying to find ways to cope. So what are some of the acts of bullying? Um, so Gabby. Why can't you get it together, Blondie? So I work hard. I raise children. I have sick parents. Hey, Miss Ellen Minop with all those letters, come here. I worked really hard for my degree. I'm proud of what I've accomplished. As a friend, I'm telling you this. Gossip doesn't feel friendly, does it? Why do you still work here? I love my job. I hate you. <laughs> uh, time's wasted, sister. 
So when you have good ideas, it doesn't even have to be the ver verbal. I don't know if you can see what Gabby's doing. It's the watch checking, the eye rolling, the interrupting you while you're talking. Those are all aspects of bullying. It's making accusations against you. It's, and we call it DARVO in some, um, in some literature, you'll see that term. Deny, um, deny, retaliate, and reverse the victim and perpetrator position. So I had somebody tell me the other day, oh yeah, I mean, the person would be mean and hostile to me, and as soon as I started to defend myself, she would label me as the problem and she would report me to HR. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I've had that happen to a lot of, especially women, which is uh, where bullying women, intimidating women is more common in the workplace. Not that it doesn't happen to men, because I do talk to a lot of men who have felt bullied and intimidated in the workplace. I think more women are speaking out because of the Me Too movement and we're taking new stances. But these, these are the types of things, right? The gossip, the jokes, the innuendos. And at what point does somebody do something or say something? One of my, um, one of my whistleblowers reported that he felt like another female, also law enforcement officer, Federal Marshal Service, um, female LGBT um, was being mistreated. And he reported it. Well, he got fired. She kept her job. But it's been a long fight for both of them, all because he wouldn't be a bystander. And he thought, and oh, and they were both military. So she was, they were both um, Air Force, I believe. So he felt like he had this camaraderie to stand up for her. And when he did, and he thought as a male he would be protected, it wasn't the case. He got fired. She has man managed to uh, win her case at, at EEO and keep her job. So that's that's one of the ones we really like. That's a good story, except that he got fired. But he's going to win. Um, plagiarism is another thing, right? Plagiarism is something that happened, not illegal, not illegal, um, unethical, immoral. Um, evil, but it's not illegal to have somebody take credit for your work, right? So that happens. That's kind of this bullying and some of these things that we think about when we think about bullying. All of this makes sense so far? None of this seems like, oh, that's never happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we get over the rainbow? How are we successful? How do we deal with bullying? Well, the first thing I always tell people, and I talk to probably about 20 people a week who go through some kind of a workplace, a hostile work environment kind of issue. So I always say you have to know the law. Are we all from the same state? Where's everybody from? Let's do a quick around the room. Nevada. Here. Tell me your name and where oh, you're from. Uh, Amy, Las Vegas. Gabby Wilson, Pensacola, Florida. <laughs> Liz Crapo, Utah. Santa, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Sample. California. Grand, California. Sarah Grand, California. Star Wars, Peace, Nevada. Samantha Mayhem, Colorado. Amy Nelson Grove, Indiana. Oh, Indiana. Josh Pierre, Florida, Tennessee. Oh. I'm here again here. Well, welcome. And you can see we've got people from across the country here. So there are federal laws, state laws, municipal laws, and then every organization has a handbook. Um, every, anybody a federal employee? Well, thank you. Private sector. School districts, child welfare. State. State, okay, state. So each one of you have different governing laws to your employment rights and your employment status. Federal employees probably the most rights, um, private sector the least. Um, and some of you, like if you're, I do a lot of like um, mental health presentations, so sometimes there are mandated reporters in the room and that's a whole other different level of protections. But for the most part, you really need to know 
what, what laws apply, what systems govern you, if you're a federal employee, OSC, MSPB, all of those things set up. Um, that's this crazy, windy road for federal employees. Otherwise, you can, you know, you can take your case to the court system. But first, you have to know what laws, what your employee handbook says. I talked to actually, it was interesting. I, I talked to a um, nonprofit volunteer recently, and she felt she was being bullied and intimidated. She's like, I'm a volunteer. I'm here to help them, and yet I'm. I'm getting screamed at and yelled at by the older generation who doesn't like my new ways of doing things. So she thought she could make a whistleblower complaint. Well, turned out the only thing there that nonprofit covered for whistleblowing was fraud, waste, and abuse, not harassment or discrimination. So now she's on a charge <laughs> to write a policy. <laughs> but so that's, so that's the first step I always tell people is know what law covers you. Now, what are the toxic tactics? So some of the things we were talking about, some of the things we were just demonstrating, I call them the toxic tactics and retaliation. Um, I have worked really hard on categorizing these nine domains, the gaslighting, the mobbing, the marginalizing, mobbing with the flying monkey, um, devaluing, the shunning, ostracizing people from the group, which is a real bullying tactic, and, um, um, and actually the double binding, the keeping you, that's a tricky one, the double binding. It's like I give you something to do that sounds like I value you, and yet I don't give you enough resources or staff or time to properly affect the mission. And so then I come back to you. <laughs> then I come back to you. Why did you, oh, you're, you're shiftless, you're lazy, you're, you know, whatever, whatever adjective. It's a leadership uh, challenge. Yeah. <laughs> you're, yes. And then we're going to, we're not, we're not firing you, we're detailing you, we're cross-training you, but we're marginalizing you out of your job, out of your space. You're going to be assigned things that don't match your um, position description. Those are all these telltale signs that are part of bullying in the workplace. Um, we think of bullying a lot as kids at a schoolyard, but those kids grow up, they, they become, you know, the psycho, the sociopath next door also goes to work, right? So those same, those same people that are perpetrators in, in the schoolyard, at home, are bullies in the workplace, and we have to learn how to deal with them and confront them. So one, you have to kind of know and be able to have a mindset that says, oh, I know what that is. That's, I, I recognize what's happening to me. I recognize the tactics being used against me. Uh, there's also a lot of cyberbullying and, and doxing, spoofing, spamming, all these new um, IT-enabled ways of reaching out and harming somebody. And I mean, some of those things are like, um, we, had a, we had a case, I won't say the case, but her boss was on her Twitter account saying horrible stuff about her. And her boss said, well, but it's my own Twitter account, it's my personal time, I can say what I want. Well, she won her case, because no, you can't. It's, that's when he crosses over into that illegality, and you can prove it. Um, Doxing is releasing your private information. It's, it's a HIPAA violation issue, but we're seeing more and more of that. Um, medical records being uploaded into court cases. That's doxing. So know yourself. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, nobody makes you feel anything you don't give permission to. So this starts with just recognizing where you're at in the world. Knowing, knowing yourself and knowing and owning your narrative. Um, and I think that's a challenge for women as well. We're not good at knowing or owning our own narrative. And I always tell whistleblowers, you have to turn around the story. This isn't what you did wrong, it's about what you own. So write your narrative, write a long, write a book, have an elevator speech. Know what you wanna say about who you are. And then 
how do you start to deal with and start coping with what's going on? And, you know, we use this SWAT approach. I mean, this sounds familiar from some of the Army resilience or military resilience training. Um, know what your strengths are, know what your weaknesses are, what are your strengths, what are your opportunities to make change in, in, the, in your area, or what do you have to do for yourself to help you cope. And when you start doing this brainstorming, I think you start taking back your power. Because when I talk to people, I can hear the panic, I can hear the, the slide. They are, um, they're distressed, they're depressed, they're feeling alone and nobody, and they can't, they, they can't see who they are. They've lost sight of their own power. So we, we actually talk about how do, you, how do you figure out where your problem areas are, where are your good areas, where are your opportunities, where are your threats? How do you balance them out? How do you prepare to deal with and go into combat armed, right? Um, how do you go into the workplace feeling restored and confident. A big part of this is know your bully and know your organization. Um, remember that org chart? Where, where are you in the org chart? Where is your perpetrator in the org chart? Sometimes your perpetrator is above you, a supervisor, a senior leader, could be the bully or the perpetrator. Um, sometimes it's a coworker. I mean, I was talking to one woman, a, a nurse in a private hospital, and her, her bully was a coworker. And she said that when she sat and talked to this person and kept saying, why don't you like me? I like you, why don't you like me? The woman kept saying, I don't know, there's something about you, I just don't like you. And so we talked about, well, how, how can you work with somebody like that? Um, is there a workaround? Is there a way to know this person any better and figure it out? And sometimes these issues are interpersonal. I've talked to, you know, they've, um, they've had those workplace romantic relationships. Other people find out about them and people start to gossip and they have, a, and if the relationship ends, then there's a whole other level of gossip. But the, those alliances that you have in the workplace are really important to this because that might be triggering for the bully. There could be some jealousies there insecurities on behalf of a bully, right? Whenever we talk about bullies, we tend to know that, they're, that they themselves have been hurt. And what do we say in the mental health world? Hurt people hurt people. So you kind of have to be able to maybe take a, take a step back and see who your bully is and what they're doing and where they're at in their situation too. And, and how is this affecting the workplace? Is it one bully? Is it a group of bullies? Is there a bunch of mean girls at work? Are they ganging up on you? Are they making fun of you? Again, why are they? And where are they sitting? And how are they interacting with you and each other? And then there are these organizational cultural issues. Um, I remember talking to one woman. She was out of the military, but she worked at a Navy base out west. Um, up north that west <laughs> and she was like one of eight women in an organization of 2,000 men and she kept filing complaints and nothing was getting done and I said to her well so we know that strategy doesn't work what are other strategies how can you become more resilient in an environment that makes you more uncomfortable and again we went back to own your own narrative take me in charge of you and at the end of the conversation, she says, oh my God, I feel like I, I, you, you've given me the tools to take back my power so that the bullies are depowered. You know, a bully can't bully you if you're not paying attention to them. <laughs> so who are your allies? Remember, who are these guys? Who's your scarecrow, your tin man, your cowardly lion? Who's, who's on this yellow brick road with you? Because if you're being bullied, there's also the possibility that other people are being bullied. And where can you form alliances and start turning that around so that you're not feeling so alone and isolated? That there are, that you have your posse, you have your team, you have your people that 
that build you up instead of tearing you down. So who can you go to? And, and sometimes it's not in the workplace. Sometimes you have to reach outside of your workplace and recognize that there's a community. You're all women veterans, you're here at this conference. You may work with a bunch of assholes, but you come here and you're restored by people who, who value you and give back to you, as opposed to the people who tear you down and don't give you enough resources and then blame you for not being successful. You have to, you have, to have the people who restore your energy and build you up. Because the one thing about resilience, they always talk about the bounce back of resilience, but if, if the ball is deflated, it doesn't bounce. So you have to constantly be nurturing that and be inflating your ball so it can bounce back. If, it, if you don't have that, it doesn't work. Um, Whistleblowers of America is a peer support program. That's mostly what I do, is I help people with their bounce, with inflating their ball so they can bounce back the next time they have to go into battle through the judicial system. And, and if there are these people and you are being bullied and retaliated against, this is where you start to document your evidence. Get their support in writing. Even if you, if you send out an email, hey Jane, thanks for being so nice to me today. It really helped after this bad situation. BCC yourself. And now you've created a document that is a um, contemporaneous notes about an incident that might have happened. And if Jane writes back, yes, that was so horrible, you know, that's in your, your pocket for your attorney if ever you need one. <laughs> no, the conflict. Why, what, what's going on in this, in this interpersonal relationship that is, is causing this problem? Again, is it jealousy? Is it the job? Is it something else? Is it community? If we live in a small town, sometimes, you know, you're the cousin of your boss's wife and, you know, he wants to get divorced, so he hates you because he thinks you're going to tell her stuff about him, <laughs> right? So what are these behind the scenes issues that are maybe leaving, leading to this conflict? What are the roles? What are the expectations of roles? Are you doing your job? Then it's, not, then it's not on you. If you're struggling with doing your job, then that's something else you have to be honest about. You have to ask for that help. You have to identify the shortfalls. If they're giving you too much work to do, not enough resources, not enough time. I'm gonna to talk to clinicians all the time who have these productivity standards, and then they work three, four hours after the clinic is closed to do all their chart notes. That's forcing you into becoming an, a workaholic and neglect your own family that you need to take control over and, and go back and say, this is what's really going on for me. Again, you're putting it in writing. You're documenting what your issues are. You're not hiding from it. You're putting it up front. And then, of course, these are the things you put in your opportunities and threats. You have to see where the wrongdoing is and be able to document it. So I think this one is the, for people who are in their, that emotional crisis state, de-escalation is hard. Because when you're escalated, it's hard to be in control and de-escalate. But you always have to, especially in the workplace, have to remain civil and not be insubordinate, especially if your bully is your boss, right? So you want to always be graceful. You want to always be the person who, when they go low, we go high. You want to be that person, right? You always want to be the most civil, graceful, professional that you can possibly be. Um, and then, Make sure that you're getting clarity, that you're asking good questions, um, and when you're collecting evidence and you're gonna, and if you are gonna make a disclosure, the one thing I always tell people is do it on your own time and your own dime, because anything you put, especially in the government, anything you put on their computers, they own. Mm -hmm. So be very careful how you do some of your tracking and monitoring of the situation, and. Um, you know, call lawyers, always be checking in, 
let HR know what's going on, make your reports, but be ready to de-escalate. Ask for common ground, like, okay, so maybe we don't agree on 100% of the project. Let's sit down and figure out the three things we can agree on, or the one thing. What's the one thing we can agree on? What's the one thing we can do together? And if you're always the person asking to be doing the right thing, then it's a little harder, not impossible, but it's a little harder to be the one that the organization labels as the troublemaker and the problem child and the difficult person to deal with. Um, and I always tell people, if you're going to write an email, make sure it's not while you're um, crying, drunk, <laughs> <laughs> um, very upset or mad, right? You want, yes, you want to sometimes take a breath, breathe, and then think about it, write it, put it in a, a Word document so you can read it later, and then think about it again, edit what you're trying to say, but never pick up a phone mad or stressed. And if somebody calls you, this is really not a good time for me to talk. I need, I need a minute. And we're gonna talk about some of those stress relievers in a second. So accept the things you cannot change. <laughs> that should sound familiar to some of you. Um, no, no, if there is no winning in this organization, there is no winning with this, um, this particular bully. Think outside your box, right? What are your, what are your SWAT? Where can you have SMART goals? Where can you think about your career and its trajectory? What is best for you in this situation? And sometimes it's not, it's not sticking in the fight. You've done, if you feel like you've done all you can, then maybe it's time to look for a new job. And I've talked to folks who have gone through this and the worst possible outcome, they've had to leave their job. But they've learned how to reinvent themselves. They've gone back to school, they've gotten, um, they've gotten other degrees. I had one lady who decided to become a private investigator after, um, I think being like a tech in a lab. So instead of doing this very computer she really got herself out there and did something she thought was much more interesting. Those are the kinds of things to do that are a challenge. Manage your stress. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> we say this a lot. Um, we give a lot of lip service to this, but this is an everyday, right? This is an everyday. You come first. This is what you should do every morning, noon, night, whenever you can get it in. Even if you have to go to the bathroom to pee, do your mindfulness. Breathe, relax, take time for you. Do things that you need to do. Do things for your family because those are your allies. That's part of your, your whole entire social support system. Everybody should by now know this 800-273-8255. If you're not a veteran, you don't have to press one. If you're a veteran and you press one, you're gonna find help. And we'll talk more about that at the end if we have time. And then if you do have to take legal action, you know, you go back to step one, know the law, know what applies, know how to document, know how to find an attorney, know how to write your, your narrative, um, timelines, org charts, pictures, recordings, all those things become important to how you make your case and how you can win. And, but be prepared, sometimes these things cost money. So it's gonna be really important if you're hiring an attorney that you have your family and whoever else might be um, impacted by an economic change dialed into that. I wanted to list up some resources because um, I think this is important. There are, of course, Whistleblowers of America, that's us. The Workplace Promise Institute is more of the training that we do. Dignity at Work, trying to get the states to pass anti-bullying legislation. Um, they're trying to get this across the country and every state legislature to do this. I think there's been an effort in California. I know up in Massachusetts. We've got a group in Florida. 
um, but getting every state to have an anti-bullying dignity at work act has been really important. Um, there's the Workplace Bullying Coalition that has some of the same information, but lots of tools and techniques for coping with bullying. And of course the EEOC is where you would make a, a claim if you've been mistreated at work based on race, gender, you know, all those 14 things. I can never remember all of them. <laughs> but that's where you can go. And the EEOC, even though sometimes it might be hard to get them on the phone, they're great at talking you through your case. It may take a little, a little time and patience to do that, but I've, I've had some great conversations with EEOC representatives. Um, I think I'll have time for questions, comments. Yes, ma'am. So I've been taking some notes um, from your speaking, and um, because this is something that I think most of us have experienced. I'm still on, uh, I'm currently in the military. I'm on passive status temporary, even though I'm still status military. Mm -hmm. I'm a labor commander, very loving position. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody wants to hang out with you, and they try to avoid you because they, if you want to talk to them, it's because you're in trouble. <laughs> but um, what I have done, and this has been the best thing, never really had to move forward. I mean, right now, it's been mostly verbal counseling with people or like trying to mediate. So the thing that I say is document all conversations in the calendar to date and time. Because you're never going to remember. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a formal medical memorandum for record, but you know, just document it. Uh, I have files on different people because <coughs> like you, um, then I can never say, well, this happened on that day. Because I've come into units where they want me to get rid of somebody. And I'm like, okay, where's their unfavorable information file? Or where's the guy who made the whole person? And they said, well, I'm not your girl. I'm not doing this. Right. Like, this is something that you didn't take care of and, you know, moving forward. But I'm not going to get rid of somebody because you don't want something that I'm going to do for That's here. Uh, next thing is, um, and, and with that documentation, as objectively as possible, and it's hard sometimes, particularly if it's that person and you. It's right. a little bit easier if it's, you know, somebody comes to you and says, I, I don't know what to do. Right. Um, and then I'll have that person document something, because I'm not gonna write what they say. Right. Uh, then the other thing is, have another person in the room. If you know that this has the potential for being something hostile, I just had another person in the room. And when I didn't, I don't do that anymore. I don't not have another person in the room. When I didn't, I would just say, Okay, we're doing a timeout now. I'm dismissing you from my office, and I need the name of your supervisor and your commander, and we will regroup with them in the room. Yeah. And if I'm dealing with a male, I have a male in there. If I'm dealing with a female, I have a female in there. So there's never this like, okay, it's like a female and two males. Does that make sense? No, we would. And then the other thing is, um, respectfully, any conversation or encounter cannot de escalate and contact their direct report. So those are some of the things that. I've learned by the mistakes that I've made. Yeah. No, and I appreciate that. I mean, I, I've done some of those same things. I put the, my top 10 together um, because whenever I found I was giving out this advice constantly to people, um, especially if I wasn't sure yet that they even had a case. So, how do you handle a situation before you even? And, and we work mostly with people who have blown the whistle. Lots of times, people. And say, I'm thinking about doing that. What should I do? And that's what we talk through. And I find I give them this same type of, depending on the situation, the same type of um, advice and guidance to how you walk through it. Um, if you are, again, and I think you brought up a good point. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of this mostly from if you're the victim, but what if you're the manager in the org, in the org chart trying to keep two other people? from being in this bullying situation. And I think what you said is really important about how you encounter that. Um, we have a few more minutes. Any other questions? Um, I wanted to introduce Amy really quick, Sue, because I skipped over some of the stress management stuff because I knew she would be here. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I could get a little help. So, what we do with stress management sometimes, especially if you're at work and you, you're stuck in a cubicle or you're on an assembly line and you really can't 
go and you know, roll out a yoga mat and get in a full practice, there are some stress relieving techniques that I think are important. Just the simple breathing and um, some um, simple things you can do without having to make a big scene or without people really even observing that you're taking control of your physiological system to help you cope with the stress. So Amy, why don't you talk yeah. a little bit about what you do, because I find this fascinating. So um, I was a whistleblower. Um, I worked for the Department of Defense for 20 years, contracting officer, and um, I left that. MBA, all that stuff, I was going to do it for 30 years. And um, I ended up getting a, a second master's in spiritual psychology and I worked with trauma specialists all over the world, helping good people do good work. And after you, I love your point. What they do is they push you and push you and push you till you do something, then they file against you. I see it all the time. I've been working for employee assistance programs for 20 years. So I want to give you some of my favorites. The thing is, you want to before you take an action, like I said, make sure you're, you have reset your system. And there's lots of ways to do that. So I work with the trauma specialists all over the world. Um, I wanted to show you this. It took us, you know, five years to make this piece of paper. Which, rec which has a bunch of videos and PDFs and resources. So no, and it's all free, everything is free. And so I'm gonna show you a couple of my great breathing. Yes, always good, when in doubt, breathe. You know, you're doing it anyway, so you might. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a heart breath, and I have a heart ma uh, heartmath.org. If you haven't heard of them, it's an amazing organization. So I want you to just put your hands on your heart. No, you can't do this wrong. And what you do is you breathe in, you can breathe into the count of four, breathe in. Hold it to seven, breathe out to eight. They say there's a magic in doing it three times. So we're gonna do one more time, breathe in four. Hold to seven, breathe out to eight. Now this is why this is called the heart breath. Now what I want you to do right now is imagine something that brings you great peace for somebody you love. I'm gonna to go to the beach, you can do whatever you'd like to do go to the beach and what I'm gonna do is on our in-breath, we're gonna breathe that into our body. So breathe that feeling of peace, of joy into your body. Hold it, let's swish around your entire body and breathe out. You may not get a chance to do this when you're in the middle of a meeting or you're about to do something, but sometimes you know, just, just touching that or imagining that and doing that breathing. What I like to do is just, it, it, like I like to tell people, it's a practice, like you said. It's like you don't wait to the day before your six month dental appointment to brush your teeth. Do it every day, I hope, probably a couple times, and even dental club. This is a practice. You don't wait till you're in trouble because you, then, then you're done. And um, there's all, uh, tons and tons of techniques. Another one of my favorites that you can do in, you know, in a meeting or whatever, is you imagine, you put your hands together, <clears throat> and imagine that there's a pearl in there. Right? And you don't want to squish it, and you don't want to drop it. And you're doing that, and you might come. Mm -hmm. That can reset you just like that. You can do that. This is an outhavening technique. You're going down. Simple. The thing is you've got to do it. And you want to do it before you pick up that phone or you walk into that meeting or you do a thing. Do that, center yourself, and then do the thing. And even if somebody's coming in, you can still stop, right? Maybe do it under the table. <laughs> Get centered and, and then do that. I mean, lots of techniques I'd be honored to share. And I'm so grateful that you're for what you do. I know you're all doing amazing work in, in Jacksonville. Oh my God, thank you so much. So thank you for that little bit. So that's why I say stress management can be a, a, a two minute practice, that breathing, that mindfulness. I, for me, I call it embracing your inner giraffe. Mm. Because whistleblowers, we stand tall and we stick our necks out every day, but we have to be proud and feel centered and good about what we do. So. Deep breath. Thank you for your service. Thank you for being here. Thank you.